2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 10 to 12, it says this. It says, and now see what the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir are doing. You would not let our ancestors invade those nations when Israel left Egypt, so they went around them and did not destroy them. So now see how they reward us, for they have come to throw us out of your land, which you gave us as an inheritance. Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against the mighty army, this mighty army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. Let's pray. Father God, over these next few moments, Lord, I pray right now that, that Father, our hearts would be open to receive everything that you have for us, Lord. I pray right now, God, that you would take, Father, center stage, Lord. I step back so that you can step forward, Lord. Not my words, but your words. Not my thoughts, but your thoughts. Less of me and more of you. Father, let the word be sowed into our hearts and let it produce, Father, a good fruit today. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. And everybody says, amen. amen. Before you're seated, look at your neighbor and say, you look good today. Amen. Come on, say that. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Some of you, you're, like, you're sitting next to your spouse and you're like, you look real good. Come on, somebody. Amen. Rosie, you look real good, baby. Praise him. Come on, baby. You got to do the same thing. Thank you. All right. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on. All right. Let's close it up. No, I'm playing. I'm joking. All right. Praise God. Hey, so, so we've been talking about victory, right? We've been talking about victory. It's been our theme. It's been our, basically, it's, it's our prophetic theme for the year. It's what God has, has put on our hearts for Lifeway. And for the people of Lifeway, and so if you're here today, the word victory is for you. Everybody say victory. victory. This, this story that we're, re we're reading in 2 Chronicles, and, and I would encourage you, you know, to keep your tablet or, or device open to 2 Chronicles 20. If you have your Bibles, keep it open there to 2, to 2 Chronicles 20 because we're going to read a lot of verses. But this story of King Jehoshaphat tells of a time when he was threatened by the enemies, by his enemies, and they surrounded him and his kingdom. He, he didn't know what to do. It's a story that begins with great fear, but ends with greater, a greater victory. So, so how many of us in this room want to experience a greater victory? All right. You not, no, you don't want that. Let me ask it again. That was like, like, okay, how many of you want to experience a greater victory? Come on. Amen. How many of you know that God doesn't want you just to talk victory and declare victory? He wants you to walk in it. Amen. It's more than a catchphrase. It's more than a slogan. It's more than a, a t-shirt that you wear. And there's nothing wrong with it. If you want to buy a t-shirt, $25 after service. Come on, somebody. But it's more, it's more than a slogan. It's more than, you know, a, a, a bumper sticker. It's more than just something that comes out of your mouth. Even though what we declare is important, it is something that God has declared over you and me today. He doesn't only want us to talk victory, he wants us to live in victory and walk in victory, amen? And so this story is a perfect example for many of us today because there are some of us here in this room, like we're in a place where we're trying to, we're, you know, some of you are like, man, pastor, you, you're just glad, you should be glad I just got here, you know, because I don't usually come to church. And so I, I don't know about you, but victory, I'm just trying to get to church. And that's okay. You're, you're at a place where you're, you're maybe in the beginning stages of your faith or maybe you're searching today. But I want you to know this, no matter where you're at in your walk or your journey with God, that God still declares victory over you. Victory over your family, victory over your children, victory in every aspect of your life. God has not called you to defeat. God has not called you to retreat. He has called you to victory. And so this story is a great illustration. It's a great example to us about how we can go from, from great fear to great victory. And so we're going to learn some things, and we're just going to dive in. And I encourage you, again, take notes. And, and if you'll just give me some time, I promise you that you're going to be blessed by what you're about to hear. So here's the first lesson that we can learn from this story. Here's number one. When you rise, the enemy will rise against you. Okay, let me say that again. When you rise, the enemy will rise against you. Listen to what it says in 2 Chronicles 20 verse 1. After this, everybody say that with me. After this. One more time. After this. Now watch. It says, after this, 
The armies of the Moabites, the Ammonites, and some of the Meunites declared war on Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was the king of Judah. He was the one in charge. He was the one sitting on the throne. And the Bible says that after this, so for us to understand, you know, you know why they attacked, you have to understand what after this means, right? So it says after this. So what is after this? The Bible tells us in the previous chapter that, that King Jehoshaphat, he began to reform the kingdom. The kingdom was away from God. The kingdom had, had been in rebellion. The kingdom had drifted away from the ways of God. The, 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 the kingdom had disobeyed God. And so now that, that he steps onto the throne, King Jehoshaphat, he, he begins to reform the kingdom that had drifted away from the Lord. He literally did a road trip. If you read chapter 19, you'll discover that he literally went throughout the kingdom. He traveled throughout the kingdom on a road trip. And all he did on that road trip was he encouraged the people to return to the Lord. He traveled throughout Judah and saying, it's time for us to get back to God. It's time for us to return to, to the Lord. It's time for us to get right with God. He not only encouraged the people to return to the Lord, he began to appoint judges and Levites to preside over cases that involve civil and religious matters. He challenged the judges and the Levites to rule with wisdom and to be led by God and not to fear people and not to be intimidated by people. So what he began to do is he began to set the nation in order. And that's what happens when we come to faith in Christ. Think about that for just a moment. When we come to faith in Christ, we don't come to faith in Christ because we're perfect, right? We come to faith in Christ because we recognize that we're broken. So you, you may be here today and say, man, you guys are intense here. You guys, man, I'm not, I'm not at your level. That's okay. We didn't start out this way. We, we all started out at the same place. That's a place of brokenness where, where we recognize that we had a, a need for God. And so here, Je Jehoshaphat, he begins to tell the people, we've drifted away from God. We've drifted away from his ways. We've drifted away from his word. And it's time for us to get back. And so as soon as he begins these reforms, as soon as he began these reforms, this is when the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the other nations march against them. Now, do you think that's a coincidence? Have you ever noticed that in your life, whenever you decide to do things right, that the, the moment you decide to do things right in your marriage, in your family, in your finances, it, you begin to say, I'm going to do things right. I'm going to do things the right way. And the moment you begin to do things right, that all of a sudden you get hit. You're like, Pastor, I thought you said following Jesus was going to make it better. It's gotten harder. Anybody been there? Like, man, I thought I, thought I was going to overcome and I thought I was going to conquer. But the fact is, is the moment that you begin to rise up and rise up to another level, you have to recognize that the enemy isn't going to sit back and say, okay, let me just leave him alone. The moment that you decide to rise up, the enemy will rise up against you. You want to know Why? Because the enemy of your soul wants to keep you in captivity. He wants to keep you captive to your failures, captive to your mistakes, captive to your limitations, captive to your insecurities, your fears. He wants to keep you captive, come on, to your past. He doesn't want you to advance. He doesn't want you, right, to, to make progress. He doesn't want you to move forward. He wants to keep you stuck, stuck in a rut. Stuck in, in, in your self-despair and in, 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 your, in your anxiety and all those things that, that hold you down. And so the moment that you decide to rise up, the enemy says, if you're going to rise up, I'm going to rise up against you. I wish I could say that that, that never happens, that the enemy is just going to leave you alone. But the Bible does say that the enemy, he, he, pro, he, uh, he prowls like a, roaring, uh, like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know... Uh, you think about this, that, you know, Moses didn't get attacked until, until he stepped out of the desert and started leading God's people. Come on, somebody. David was safe as long as he stayed in the pasture, but the moment he decided to confront Goliath and, and step out of the pasture from being a shepherd to being a warrior, then the attacks happened. Come on. Uh, Elijah wasn't attacked until he started operating as a prophet. Peter was left alone until he started preaching. Come on. Paul was okay as long as he did what everybody else was doing. But the moment the apostle Paul began to preach the gospel, then he was attacked. You need to know something that the attack isn't, isn't a sign that you're doing something wrong. It's a sign that you're doing something right. 
You may be here today and you go, oh, well, you know, Pastor, I've never been attacked. I've been saved 20 years and nothing's ever happened to me. Well, I'd say you're not doing anything. <laughs> you're not doing anything except warming a seat, maybe. But how many of you know that God didn't call you to warm a seat? God didn't call you to live a life with potential. He called you to fulfill it. He didn't call you to die with your potential. He called you to die at the end of your life to, to see, I've been productive. I've accomplished things. So the enemy fights you, right? Here, here's something interesting to note that the Bible tells us that, that God's people were, were threatened in a, uh, by the Moabites and the Ammonites. And this is significant because the Moabites and the Ammonites were distant relatives of God's people. In fact, they were direct descendants of Lot. They were cousins. The Moabites and the Ammonites were cousins to God's people. They were born out of incest and deception in Genesis chapter 19. You, you go home and you read it. But Lot had two children, Ammon and Moab, and those two sons, right, they, 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 they birthed the nation of the Moabites and the Ammonites. They were cousins of, of, of the descendants of Abraham. Now check this out. The Moabites, we find them all throughout the Old Testament. And they're, the Moabites are like the annoying cousins that you have. I, I hope you're not that annoying cousin. Come on. Uh, but you know that crazy cousin, Eddie, you know what I mean? Or, or, or cousin Eric or, or cousin Sally who's just lost her mind. Come on, somebody. Uh, I apologize if your name is Ricky or Sally here in this place. I'm not apologizing if your name is Eddie. Come on, somebody. But, but the Moabites, the Moabites were, were the annoying cousins that would just pester, pester you. They just pester you. They just annoy you. They don't leave you alone. They pick, they pick, they pick, right? So, so they were the annoying cousin. But the Ammonites, the Ammonites weren't just annoying. The Ammonite people were violent. They, they, they didn't want to just fight you. Honestly, if you, if you study the history of the Ammonites, they were violent and they wanted to destroy you. They wanted to kill you. They're, the Ammonites are the cousins, that are, they're in the MS-13 gang that will cut you up. Come on, somebody. I'm just being honest. So why is this, why is that funny? I don't know why that's funny. It's dangerous. Nobody wants to be cut up. Come on. But watch this. Watch this. It's important to understand. They say, Pastor, why is this important? Because remember, it's the Moabites and the Ammonites, the annoying cousins and the violent cousins that are threatening them. What does that mean? It means this, that as, as you begin to make progress in your faith walk, as you begin to rise up, don't be surprised when there are people who are close to you that will want you to retreat, that will want to hold you back. This has nothing to do with race. It has nothing to do with ethnicity or gender. Listen, there are people who, who are with you right now, but the moment you begin to rise up, the moment you get that promotion, the moment that you get married, the moment you begin to have family, the moment you begin to make some money, come on, somebody. The moment you got a little bit of money and you got a honey, come on, somebody. Listen, the, mo the moment you begin to advance, they're going to hold you back. They're going to they're gonna try to hold you back. They're not for you. They're for you as long as you're at their level. Come on. So you're making, you're making advancements, so you're getting your life right with God. And, and well, they should be celebrating you, but they're not celebrating you. They're condemning you. You? <laughs> Come on. I know what you did. I know what you've done. What are they doing? The people who are closest to you are trying to hold you back. <laughs> not everybody celebrates your progress. Not everybody shows up to your graduation party. Not everybody shows up at your wedding. Not everybody shows up when you begin to make progress in your walk with the Lord. But know this, that you will never have victory by compromising or retreating. I've never heard anybody say, we retreated and we won. Remember that God gives victory to his anointed. Psalms 20, verse 6 and 8, we preached this about five weeks ago. What was it? It says, and God gives victory to his anointed, though, different, though people may fall. Listen, we rise up and we stand firm. So that's, we have to understand that. That when we rise up, some, sometimes the enemy is going to rise up against us. In fact, I would say that almost every time. Here's number two, is that leadership 
makes a difference. Say that with me. Leadership makes a difference. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 3 to 5, it says this, Jehoshaphat, the king, was terrified by this news and begged the Lord for guidance. Let me pause for a moment. When you think of a leader, right, you don't think someone who's afraid. You don't think of somebody who's begging. When you think of a good leader, you think someone who's strong, someone who's decisive, someone who knows where he's going, who knows what he's doing. So Jehoshaphat here, it says that he was not that. It says he was the opposite. He was terrified by this news and begged the Lord for guidance. And he also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. So people from all over the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. And Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah and Jerusalem. You know what? Uh, here at Lifeway over the last two years, we've built, we're, we're, we've built a lot of leaders and we're building a lot of leaders. Of all generations, we've got some young people that are strong leaders. I mean, amazing. The future is bright at Lifeway because of these strong leaders, right? And not only of young people, but all the generation and all the races and all different types of background. We're, we're building leaders. And so our, our definition of leadership here at Lifeway is a very simple one. It's influence. Everybody say influence. If you have influence, you're a leader. And so... Everyone on some level has influence, right? Everybody does. You influence your friends. You influence your children. You influence your spouse. You, you influence people at your job. And so, so leadership makes a difference. And in this story, right, we have to recognize is that how a leader responds to crisis matters. It matters. Why? Because if you panic, they panic. If you complain, they complain. If you look for someone to blame, they will look for someone to blame. If you crumble, they will crumble. This is the weight and the responsibility of leadership. Now listen, if you want to know about your leadership and you're a parent today, all you got to do is listen to your kids. Because they will imitate what they see and hear in you. It, this is not always the case, but, but it, there's, there's exceptions to the rule. But I would say this is that... Is that they're a byproduct of your leadership. I understand there's certain personality traits that, that, that happen in, in kids and stuff like that, but they, but they will repeat what they see. So if your kid's a complainer, don't complain about them complaining, complainer. <laughs> if your kid's always whining, take a look in the mirror first because leadership matters. Leadership makes a difference. See, and in this story, listen, I know we, we look at Jehoshaphat and it says that, that he was terrified and that he begged the Lord for guidance. And so I understand that qualities of a leader is like strong, decisive, courageous, fearless. All these things are great qualities of a leader. But we see different qualities here in Jehoshaphat. It wasn't that he was a bad leader. He just displayed different characteristics at this moment. See, I can appreciate the fact that, jo that Jehoshaphat, excuse me, was honest. Right? He was honest. He's like, I don't know what to do. How many of you know that honesty is important in leadership? And not only was he honest, but he was humble. He begged. In other words, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't like above bowing before God and saying, I don't have the answers and I need your help. Isn't that amazing? That if you're a mother or a father today, that you don't have to have all the answers. It's okay if you don't know. There are things that people come to me with, and I don't know what to do. So I honestly say, give me a moment, give me some time, let me pray, let me get God, and then I'll come back to you. I don't make it up as I go. See? And I can appreciate the fact that Jehoshaphat was honest. He didn't hide the fact that he was afraid and that he didn't know what to do. Yet he was smart enough. Everybody say smart enough. He was smart enough to take his own advice. What do I mean by that? In the, in the chapter before, when he's calling the people back to God, when he's telling the, the judges and the Levites to, to, to rule and to judge with, uh, with, with honor and integrity and good character, he says this in 2 Chronicles chapter 19, verse 9. He says this, these were his instructions to the people. You must always act in the fear of the Lord. You know what that means? It means you must always act by honoring God. Please do not mistake fearing the Lord with being afraid of God. Fearing the Lord is about honor and respect 
and reverence. Being afraid of God is not knowing God. You want to know who's afraid of God? It's the sinner who will stand before him in judgment. Those who've rejected Christ. But I don't, I'm not afraid of God, but I fear the Lord. I have reverence for him. I honor him. He is my king. He is my God. He, Jesus is my savior. I have fear, a healthy respect and honor. But I'm not afraid of God. You want to know why? Because if I'm afraid of God, I'll never approach him. But if I have the fear of the Lord, I will revere him and honor him. And so here, watch this. He tells the people in the previous chapter, you must always act in the fear of the Lord with faithfulness and an undivided heart. With faithfulness and an undivided heart. And so what happens is he gives this counsel, he gives this command to the people, advice, if you want to call it that. And now one chapter later, he has to take this advice. Can I say something to everybody here? Everybody look at me. Be careful with the advice that you give others, you know, because it may be the advice that you need one day. Well, what she need to do, and it may be great advice, but you need to practice it too. <laughs> well, let me tell you what to do. Great advice. Gorg doesn't contradict the word. Why don't you do it? Are you, are you following me here today? And so what happens is, is that he comes to this place and he's honest. He says, I'm afraid. I don't know what to do. I'm terrified. They're going to destroy me. So, he, so we, see, we see honesty and we see humility. We see that, that he says, fear the Lord and be faithful with an undivided heart. What does that mean to be faithful? It means that you're to be loyal. It's easy to be loyal to God when you're surrounded by Christians on a Sunday morning at the 1030 service with the worship band playing. And you can hear and feel the music. The, 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 the bass is vibrating. That little thing in the back of your throat is shaking. Come on, somebody. You feel the presence of God. But can you be loyal on Monday? Can you be loyal on Tuesday? Can you be loyal on Wednesday when you're stuck in traffic and you want to blurt out a word that you shouldn't say? Come on, somebody. Or how about when someone wants to give you some nice juicy gossip? Or how about when you're tempted to fornicate? Come on. Or how about if you're tempted to lust after somebody? Can you be loyal to God then? Or how about when you're tempted to lie? Or what about when you're tempted to do something that doesn't honor God on Saturday night when nobody's watching and you're on the other side of town? Come on. Can you be loyal then? Can you be faithful then? And then he says to, to have an undivided heart. What does that mean? Is that, that, is that my heart doesn't belong to to this thing or this thing or this thing and this thing and it doesn't belong to this but it only belongs to you how many of you know that he's lord of all or lord of nothing <laughs> let me say that again he's he's either lord of all or he's lord of nothing and so he says that now watch in, in leadership matters leadership makes a difference in chapter 20 we see three types of leadership we see three displays of leadership we we just read the first one King Jehoshaphat led the people in seeking God. Here's the second one. The men led their families. Men. The men led their families. We're living in a moment right now. Well, let me read the scripture and then I'll get into the commentary here. 2 Chronicles 20 verse 13 to 14. It says this. And as all the men, as all the men, as all the Men of Judah stood before the Lord. They stood before the Lord. Who did? The men did first. The men went first. The men stood, and then it says they stood with their little ones, wives, and children. So the wives and the children, come on, and the little ones, they followed what the men did. Now, please do not misunderstand this, ladies. Are you a God chauvinist? Does God, God, does God not have a place for me? Oh, absolutely. You have a role and you have a gifting. Come on, we see, we see God do great things in the scripture, in the story of Ruth. With the story, come on, we see the story of Deborah, the judge. We see the story of Mary. We see, come on, do you know the Bible says in the book of Luke that it was women who helped support financially the ministry of Jesus? They were part of the early church. Come on. 
So ladies, I'm not trying to diminish your role. You have a role, an important, powerful role to play in the kingdom. But so do men. And you want to know what's happened in our culture today? What's happened is that men have been demasculinized. If you look at the TV shows, dads, they're dumb. They don't know what they're talking about. They're always out of touch. They always have the bad ideas. Oh, dad, you don't know anything. Men, listen, men are even being taught to question if they're a man. Softer side of men. Gosh. Like men don't know if to wear jeans or wear a dress. Why is it quiet in here? Have we been so programmed that we can't even say truth? Uh, listen, you can change your clothes, but your DNA will always say you're a man. You could, pastor, pastor, no, 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 this, you're being a little insensitive here because people have, real, I understand. Who do you think is attacking their minds? It's not the Holy Spirit. It's not God. God said he created man and he created woman. Come on. He didn't create something in between. Well, listen, I, it's because I, I, you know, I, it's because on the inside. Listen, the enemy's attacking your mind. And as a church, we were afraid to say anything. See, there's quiet in here. No one's saying amen. Huh? He's like, he's, he's, he's been, on, been on YouTube. He's been on Facebook, Pastor. Off camera. <laughs> like there are there are men who are confused. Women who are confused. I'm not listen, I'm not trying to attack, I'm trying to liberate you. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Yeah, it's like it says a man led their families. Like, we need men to rise up. We need men to be men. We need men to be leaders. Like Joshua that said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Come on, somebody. We need men to wake up on Sunday mornings and tell the kids, kids, get up. Well, I'm tired. Get up now. You're going to church. I'm so tired. Well, dads, maybe you need to turn off the internet at, at 11 o'clock. Maybe you need to turn off that internet so they're not gaming till 2 and 3 in the morning so they can wake up and be ready for church the next morning. Come on. That's right, pastor. How are we going to do that? Maybe, maybe you need to turn it off too. Come on, somebody. It says, and the men stood up. Man, we need some men to stand up. We don't need men to sit down. The enemy's telling the men to sit down. You don't got a voice. Men, be a leader. Amen. Did you like that? That was, that was off the cuff right there. Total. Here's the third, here's the third, focus, focus, focus. Everybody take a deep breath and focus. Here we go. Because this, this is not even the good part. You ready? It's all good, but it's going to get better. Watch. The Bible says that the singers led the army. That the singers went at the front. It says, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 22, it says, After consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, ahead of the, at the front. It's not the tanks. It's not the horses. It's not the chariots. It's not the, the, you know, the Marines. It's not the, the Navy SEALs. Come on, who are, right? Yeah, so that's a Marine right there. That's why he did that. So when we talk about, about Christian Army, we go, hallelujah. Come on, somebody, amen. And so anyway, but it wasn't, it wasn't the Army Rangers. It wasn't the Special Forces. It was, not, it was none of them. It was the singers. The singers. Like, I know you look at John, and he's got muscles, but that's all for show. He's, looks, he, he's strong, don't get me wrong, but it's all show. 
Where's John? Okay, he's in the back. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Whew. We're going to get more to that in just a minute. But here are two important questions. Watch this. Two important questions about leadership is who in your life serves as a leader to you? Who's the one that's holding you accountable? Who's the one that's encouraging you? Who's the one who's helping you? Who's the one who's loving you no matter what? Who's the one who's praying for you? Who's the one who's there when you're broken? Who's the one who calls you up and says, hey, we've missed you? Who's the one who says, hey, man, you need to get straight right, right with God? Who's the one who, who corrects you? Who's the one who blesses you? Who's the leader in your life? Well, I don't need anybody. Eh. We all need somebody. He didn't create you to be an island unto yourself. It's when you're alone that you're vulnerable. When you're solitary, when you're isolated, come on, then you're easy pickings. The enemy can get at you. So who's the, who's the leader in your life? And if you don't have one, it tells me, at least here at LifeWay, that you're not connected to what we're doing because we got leaders everywhere. I don't know who a leader is. Well, then get to a life group. Well, you know what? Maybe I should. Maybe you should. Well, you know, I've been thinking about it. Maybe you don't need to think anymore. Just do it. Look at your neighbor and say, just do it. Here's the second question is if leadership is influence, watch this, then who are you leading? My leadership does not start at the pulpit, guys. My leadership is not here on stage. This is not where my leadership starts. My leadership starts when I wake up in the morning and I got four children and a wife that are looking to me. They're looking to see if I'm in prayer. They're looking to see if I'm in the word. They're looking to see if I'm a man of honor. If I'm a, not perfect, I'm not perfect. You can ask my kids, I'm not perfect. Don't spill anything on, on me, guys. But th they know I'm not perfect. But watch this, I'm doing my best. That's where my leadership starts. What, what does it profit? You know, you know, in ministry, I have to be careful that I don't, my involvement in ministry doesn't sour my kids to the ministry. See, see when they see dad, dad has to be the same person here that he is at home in the kitchen. That's true of all of us. Like, Dad, man, you're such a good actor. Wow. You know how to turn it on and turn it off. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's bad, right? Right? Some of you, 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 you know what I'm talking about. Because you were like, you were yelling at your kids. You were, ah, ah, and driving. And as soon as you got to the parking lot, Who are you leading? Man, I, I got to hurry up here. Here's number three. The word of the Lord. How many of you are being blessed by this? Amen? The, come on, give God praise if you're being blessed by this. This is God's word. The word of the Lord guarantees victory. The word of the Lord guarantees victory. So the Bible says that King Jehoshaphat, he, he begged the Lord for, for direction. He prayed. He fasted along with all the people. And then it says this in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 15 to 17. He said, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent uh, of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens uh, uh, into the wilderness of Jeruel. But you will not even need to fight. Take your positions, st then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you, O people of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. So, so the Lord delivers a word. He gives a word. See, see what happens is, is that we're so, we're, we're, so, uh, we're so preoccupied with the way things are, are going to play out. We're so preoccupied with getting an answer when we should be dedicated, committed ourselves to getting a word. I need a word from God. Not just an answer. I need a word. God could have given him an answer. He says, don't worry, I got it. God could have just given him an answer. and said, don't worry about it, I got it. He didn't just give him an answer. He gave him a word. Why? Because the answer may be for a moment, but the word will never, ever fail. And the word will never expire. God, the, the, Jesus said this word in the Gospels. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word remains. I don't need just an answer. I need a word. 
I don't need an answer for my sickness. I don't need an answer just for COVID. I don't need an answer for my fears. I don't just need an answer for my finances. I need a word from God. And God gave him a word, and this was the word. Let me break it down for you. Look at your neighbor and say, break it down. Here it is. He says, number one, it's not your battle. He says, it's not your battle, it's mine. They're not coming against you, they're coming against me. How many parents, if you saw your child about to be attacked, how many of you parents would you not step in and say, you're not touching them, you're going to have to come through me? That's what God says. He says, listen, they're not coming at you. This battle is not yours. This battle is mine. Number two, he says this. He says, I want you tomorrow, verse 16, march out against them. What was he saying? He was saying, confront your fears. He didn't say go hide. Go hide in the buildings. Go hide in the trees. Go hide in the brush. And from a place of obscurity and a, and a hiding place, you'll see the victory. He says, listen, I got this battle, but I'm going to need you to face your fears. Oh, you're not hearing me today. Some of you, you need, to, you need to confront your fears. Not just hide out in your house. I'm not talking about COVID. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about things that have, have bothered you and that have tormented you. That have, that have affected your state of mind. That have affected your relationships. That have affected the relationship with your siblings. Things that you have, have held on to. God's saying, listen, I got this, but I'm going to need you to face it. You're not going to see the victory while you're hiding out in a bush. You're not going to see a victory while you're hiding out in a closet. You're not going to see the victory from a hiding place. I'm going to need you to march out like you're about to fight. And you need to ready yourself, position yourself. And when you're ready, watch, you're going to see the victory. But you're going to have to face it. See, many of us were running away from the things that torment us. And victory doesn't come from ourselves. But God wants us to face, to confront it got to confront it. Confront the bitterness. Confront the anger. Confront the unforgiveness. Confront the insecurity. Confront the fear. Confront the rejection. Confront the pain. Confront the offense. Come on. You're going to you're gonna have to rise up and you're going to have to march forward and face it. And guess what? And as you face it, you're going to say, the Lord has victory over you. And because he won, I win. You have no power over me. You have no power over me. You have no power over me. You've got to confront it. Not hide from it. Not run from it. Not ignore it, but confront it. Then number three, he says this, victory becomes because of me, not you. Everything that happens here at Lifeway... Although God uses us, and I praise God for our leaders and our volunteers, I praise God for the leadership and the worship team and our leadership and school discipleship and, and leadership and, all, and the life group leader. I praise God. But can I tell you something? It's not you. It's God. It's not Pastor George. It's God. It's not me. Pastor, you're such a great. No, I'm not great. He's great. If you see anything good in me, it's because of my daddy in heaven. It's his. And then number four, no matter, listen, now think about this. He tells them, he tells them, march out and position yourselves, right? Get ready as if you were going to fight. And then in verse 17, he finishes out by saying this. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow. Watch this. For the Lord is with you. Watch. As they're standing, as they're ready with their, with their swords and their shields, and they've got, they're ready to fight. Guess what? They're seeing, they're seeing the armies come against them. So they can see them. They can hear the march, marching of the soldiers. They can hear the stomps, the steps. What do you think that's doing? I don't know about you, but when I get nervous, my stomach gets nervous. You know what I mean? My stomach starts turning, and I'm just nervous. I, my physical body reacts. It feels when I, when I get anxious or I get nervous about something. Like, my stomach starts turning. So watch. He says this, no matter what you see. No matter what you hear and no matter what you feel, know this, that I am still with you. Some of you, some of us in this room, we let our feelings take the best of us. And, and don't, don't misunderstand. I know I've been there. I understand. But my life is not a collection of feelings. Your life is not a collection of feelings. 
Feelings are good. Don't get me wrong. God gave you the ability to feel. The senses are good. I love my senses, especially when it comes to tasting food. I love it. I love the senses. Smelling. Ah, carne asada. Come on, somebody. Some of you like some of you who like salad, I never smelt a nice salad. <laughs> Just saying. God bless you with the salad, but I'm like, rabbit. Come on, somebody. <laughs> it may look pretty. I've seen pretty salad. Rosie makes pretty salads. They don't smell good, but they, <laughs> they look good. I love the senses, but be careful that the senses don't control you. Right? Are you ready for the last one? Here it is. Number, number four, finally, praise is your weapon. You know what? You want to know, I've had people tell me, hey, Pastor George, you know, you guys got a great church there. You know, it's amazing. I, I, I'm thinking about coming back. It's just, you guys, you know, maybe just a little bit, you know, maybe tone it back. Just maybe not so aggressive. You know, just, you know I don't know. The, the music, it's a little, uh, you know. No. <laughs> no. You can't. You can't, can't do that. No, you know, I would come back. I Listen, I had people years ago, years, I'm talking about years ago, so nobody here, a recent. I remember one time I sat down with a couple. They took me and Ro Rosie, you remember this? They took us out to a really nice restaurant. Wow, this is nice. Appealing to the senses. <laughs> and we're sitting down, and they said, well, Pastor, we just wanted to meet with you. We just, we just, we love the direction of the church. Oh, thank you, thank you. Praise the Lord. We were just wondering, you know, do you think you, you think you could, like, like the music is a little loud, and, and it was nowhere like it is now. Like now, come on, somebody. But before it was like, Volume was a big thing for me, and I was always worried about it until I got freed about the fear of others. And watch, they were sitting down, and they're like, do you think you can turn down the volume because it's a little loud? I'm like, I'm like, and these, my, this is my honest answer. It's like, man, for the style of music that we're doing, that's the lowest we can do it. And I'm, I'm not trying to pick it up. That's just who we are, you know. And, and, and they're like, well, Pastor, I, I just, I don't know if you know this, but Pastor, but we're, we're tithers here. We pay tithes. And I sat there, I was like, <laughs> and I said, well, those aren't my tithes, and they're not even your tithes, they're God's tithes. I said, and I was like shaking on the, under the table, and they left the church. I'm not going to compromise, we're not going to compromise on that. You, um, we're, not, we're not making anybody come up to the altar. On Wednesdays, we do, <laughs> because that's because you're a disciple in the making. On Sundays, it's totally optional, right? As long as it's not out of order, no one's moshing up here, running into each other. <laughs> you start doing that, we'll cast that demon out of you right away. <laughs> it just looks so out of order. It's just like, what's up with that, the dancing and the jumping? and this? Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. But here's the thing is, the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 20, 21 to 24, it says that praise is a weapon. After consulting the people, the king appointed singers. Again, singers at the front. Singers. Singers. They're at the front of the army singing to the Lord, praising him for his holy splendor. This is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. They sang. They weren't wielding swords. They didn't have spears, they had bows and arrows, they had a song. You know, I think this is important to recognize because maybe you don't have a lot, but do you have a song? Come on, somebody. It says, as they began to sing and give praises, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. Notice, watch, that the moment they released the sound, the miracle began to happen. See, see, this is why the enemy wants to keep you silent. Like, I don't know this song. Make it up. Hum it. Mm, 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 until you learn it. 
I'm not a singer. Really? Have you seen yourself in your car? Have you heard yourself in the shower? You're just, you're just shy. You're embarrassed to do it at church because you've never been to a church where they, they do this. That's okay. This is the way we do it. Others do it differently, and God bless them. This is not the only way to do church, by the way. I just want you to know that. I'm not condemning anybody else's, and ours is better. No, no, this is just the way we do it. Ours is not better. No, I'm serious. This is the way we do it. I respect other people the way they do it, but this is the way we do it. They, they honor God and with their worship with a hymn or an old chorus, with a guitar, with a piano or an organ. Praise the Lord. Right? Come on. I, our way is not the only way. And so that's, ours is better. That's pride. You better be careful. And I'm not teaching you that. Come on. It says that they, they began to fight among themselves. Verse 23, the armies of Moab and Ammon turned against their allies in Mount Seir and killed everyone of them. Then they did, after they destroyed the army of Seir, they began attacking each other. Verse 24, so when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, all they saw were dead bodies lying on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of them had escaped. They won the battle without even swinging one sword. But they did release a song. Why? Because praise is a weapon. Psalms 149 says this, listen, praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, sing his praises in the assembly of the faithful. O Israel, rejoice in your maker. O people of Jerusalem, exult in your king. Praise his name with, there it is, with dancing, appropriate dancing. We don't need no fleshy dancing here. No. Get that out of here. Come on. <laughs> Why are you guys laughing? Brother Lowe, come on, help me out here. It says, praise the name with dancing accompanied by tambourine. Do we have any tambourine players in the house? Keep them at home. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm just playing. <laughs> have you ever noticed tambourines? Are they louder than everything? I'm like, hallelujah, Lord. I know it's scriptural, but Lord, help us. Just being, <laughs> who's that? Good Lord. <laughs> Santo. It says, verse 4, for the Lord delights in his people, and he crowns the humble with victory. The faithful, let the faithful rejoice that he honors them. Let them sing for their joy as they lie on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. What's in your mouth? The high praise of God. And a sharp sword in their hands. You got the praise and you got the sword. Watch. And it says why? Verse 7. To execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples. To bind their kings with shackles and their leaders with irons, chains. To execute the judgments written against them. This is the glorious privilege of his faithful ones. Praise the Lord. Psalms 8 verse 2 says this. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. That term ordained strength literally is translated into the English as out of the mouth of babes, you have ordained or established praise. Praise always equals strength. When you praise God, you're, a, you're attributing strength to God. God, you are powerful. God, you are almighty. God, you are glorious. God, come on somebody, you're omnipotent. Watch, so when I praise God, watch, it says, because of your enemies. So why does God establish praise? Because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy. So what does your praise do? It silences the enemy. If you're here today and say, well, the enemy just keeps attacking my mind, then you need to start praising. Because you can't praise and he can't talk at the same time. When you begin to praise, he has to be quiet. And if the, and, the voice is, and the enemy's voice is too loud, it's because you're too quiet. And that's, why, that's why we praise the way we do. That's why we, you know, I was sitting there and I'm like, whoa, man, everybody's singing. This is crazy. This is amazing. Man, when we praise God, the enemy can't stay in this place. He can't, he can't, he can't hit your mind. Why? Because we told him you got to be quiet. This isn't your time. This is God's time. 
I'm going to ask our worship team to come on up. I know I've gone a little long, but this is a powerful word. We're going to finish strong right now. Right? We're ready to finish strong? All right, we're going to finish strong. I, I feel it in my heart right now. It says this as we close out the story. The valley, the valley where the Moabites and the Ammonites began, where they were coming from, was initially meant to be a valley of fear, intimidation, threats. It was meant to be a valley of defeat, despair, and destruction. But God stepped in. I don't know where you find yourself today. But God can step into any circumstance. He stepped into my circumstance. When I was in a hospital and I was having an anxiety attack that I didn't know was an anxiety attack. When I felt like I was about to die, God stepped in. When I lost my father a little over a year ago to COVID, I felt saddened by the loss. I knew he was in heaven, but I was in the valley of sadness and sorrow, and that's normal, but God stepped in. When we were hit with COVID in the, in the nation, and they su shut down the, the churches, and, and I had to preach to a camera for two months, and I missed you guys, guess what? It was, there was a longing to be with you guys, but God stepped in. When my wife and I couldn't have children for almost 10 years, and we kept on trying and kept on believing, and we couldn't have children, and the doctors didn't know why, and my questions, and, my, and I'll be honest and sincere, sometimes even doubting, guess what? God stepped in. I mean, I'm, I'm just like you. Your, your circumstances may be similar. Your circumstances may be different. When I didn't have enough money to pay my bills, Years ago when the church was struggling and I found myself doing odd jobs just to put food on my family's table and I had to choose, do I, do I pay the, 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 the rent or do I put food on my table? Do I pay the car payment or do I put food on my table? When I, when I went through a very difficult time when I, we had literally nothing and it was, it was a season of great discouragement. But can I tell you something? God stepped in. When I felt like everybody had abandoned me, when I felt like everybody had left me, when I felt that the closest friends of mine who I still love, and I know they love me to this day, right, God just had to do a transition. But at the time, I couldn't see it, and I couldn't understand it, and I didn't know what to do. But God stepped in. I don't know what your situation is, but you need to let God step in. He stepped in. Now watch. That valley of defeat, that valley of despair and destruction, listen to what happens. That's what it was meant to be. But in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 25 and 26, it says this. This is after the battle. After they see that everything, that God wipes out the enemy. It says this in verse 25 and 26. King Jehoshaphat and his men went out to gather the plunder, gather the loot, gather, you know, all the, the, the spoils of war. It says, they found vast amounts of equipment, clothing, and other valuables, more than they could carry. Now remember, this was supposed to be a place of defeat and despair and destruction. But once God stepped in, watch, they took out so much they couldn't carry it anymore. It says, there was so much plunder, it took them three days just to collect it all. Verse 26, on the fourth day they gathered in the valley, in the valley of what? Come on, in the valley of? Listen, it says, which God, it's named that day because the people praised and thanked the Lord there. It is still called the valley of blessing today. You want to know why? Because when God steps in, he turns your defeat, your despair, and your destruction into a blessing. <laughs> Come on. I'm blessed. You're blessed. Lifeway is blessed. Somebody, somebody shout, I am blessed. He takes, he takes what the enemy meant for evil and he turns it for good. 
Are you hearing me? He takes what the enemy meant for evil. Stephanie, he takes what the enemy meant for evil, and he turns it for your good. And he turns it for your good. And Barbara, he turns it for your good. And he turns it for your good. And Raina, he turns it for your good. And Pete and Claudia, he turns it for your good. Come on. He turns it for your good. How does God do it? I don't know, but he does it. The enemy thought he was going to take you out. He thought he was going to knock you out. He thought he was going to, you know, he, was, he thought he was going to whoop you, but he doesn't know that God stepped in. And what the enemy meant for evil, he's turned it for your good. It all starts with saying yes to Jesus. You're here today. You say, man, that's, that's a very inspirational. It's not just inspirational today. It's, it's transformational. It can transform your life. And, and he does it not because we deserve it, but because he loves us so much. More than, watch this. We, more than we don't deserve it, God's love is greater than more than we don't deserve. He loves for us. It's called grace. He loves you today.